Welcome to the fourth session of NTV People's Parliament, a platform where Ugandans get to air their views and opinions about important issues in society. Agnes Nandutu, the Speaker of the People's Parliament, presides. Madam Speaker, I propose that we discuss the topic, are interest groups still relevant in Parliament? Do Those in favor, aye to the contrary, no? Aye. Aye is have it. Yes, good evening viewers. This is People's Parliament and we are yet discussing another very important issue that affects all of us. Do we still have, do we still need the interest groups in Parliament? I'm talking about the women MPs, the youth MPs, those representing people with, with disabilities, the army and the workers. Are they still relevant? As you are aware, uh, Article 32 Clause 1 of the Constitution establishes the basis of affirmative action in favor of groups that have been on, inf on fringes of society for long. The article also provides that the state shall take affirmative action in favor of groups marginalized on the basis of gender, age, disability, or any other reason created by history, tradition, or custom in order to correct the imbalances against them. But also you note that Article 78, Clause 2 of the Constitution also gives Parliament the mandate to retain, increase, or abolish the representation of special groups in Parliament every five years, from 2005, 10 years after the Constitution was enacted. So since these interest groups were elected in Parliament, have they served the purpose for which they were created? Let us set the ball rolling, Honorable Members. I thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Brian Tumsime is my name from Uganda National Students Association. You are welcome to People's Parliament. Thank you very much. Uh, directly for me, I uh, talk about the youth MPs. I think they have not performed to, uh, to the basics as to why they are in Parliament. But what haven't they done, rather? One, I would say that they have not come back to the electorate. Why? Because they feel they are not attached to the electorate. Because you feel, feel that only like 100 MP, uh, uh, people voted for me down there, so you don't have attachment to them. But are they youth making MP. the policies in Parliament that benefit the youth? First and foremost, I would love a policy that I have participated in, to, in its uh, drafting and generation. So and in the this case, youth. they are not consulting They are voters. not consulting us. Honorable Jared, Jared Karuhanga. You are welcome to NTV People's Parliament. Mm -hmm. Have you served the purpose of which you were created to do in Parliament as youth MP? It is an interesting opportunity to serve and represent young people in Parliament. It is also a challenge. Indeed, like he rightly put it, you represent a whole region, 26 districts. It can be a challenge. But I want to think that actually the real problem is not necessarily having five youth members of Parliament. The real problem is the breakdown of the bedrock of the moral values of our country. That we have to apologize to the young people. That these young people elected us to represent them, to focus on their issues. And all we are seen to do is busy mobilizing our colleagues, kneeling <coughs> down, and please stay in power even beyond 30 years. That's how, that has become our characteristic, that has become our definition as young leaders, as young parliamentarians. That's wrong. They used to need to hear us on unemployment. They need to hear us on, on scholarships. Why, why, for instance, uh, why, for instance, aren't state house scholarships distributed or availed in a transparent manner? Why don't they advertise? Have you demanded for it? Well, I want to say that. I, I honestly, I've spoken about it. But I think it's something we can address as young people. Is that the only problem, major problem, or the other problems? Please, I'll well, well, them out. You, see, you can have a forest of problems, but normally there is one which becomes the central problem. And I think for us in the ninth parliament, the, the preoccupation of the young parliamentarians and young leaders uh, in the life presidency of... I remember you are out of order. <laughs> you are out of order. Yes! <laughs> what is your take? Thank you very much. Who is representing you and has that person served the purpose that brought him or had parliament? Thank you, Madam Speaker. My name is Kakai Zerida. Honorable. Uh, Honorable Kakai Zerida. I have an issue with the youth MPs. They have not served our interest because they do not have checks and balances. They don't account to anybody. That's why 
the only thing they can do right now is uh, to kneel, um, look at how they get more money from parliament, look for more constituencies because they don't come back. And, and, and the reason might be, you know, these people serve one term and yes. then they, they go and look for constituencies. Has that also contributed to part of the problem because they know they are not go going back to seek for the votes and therefore to whom it may concern? Is that the case for Gerard Karuhanga? I, you know, I don't want to think that that is actually the, the real problem. So why are you not going back to your constituencies and check on the people, consult them? When you get parliament, uh, unless you, 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 you choose to focus on, on, on the issues that indeed you premised your campaign For instance, on. what have you focused on as a youth MPs <laughs> without talking about others? My biggest focus, I think, has been corruption. Because I know that corruption is directly intertwined with unemployment. Mm. And there would never be any money in this country to invest and develop our country so that we have more jobs, we have more factories, more industries, as long as that money is being spent. Okay, Honorable Member, you can take your seat. We <laughs> shall you. hear from you again. You yes, so what are the other problems, Honorable Member? The other problems are our, our members of Parliament for Youth have not consulted us. They have not pushed for any youth agenda in the Parliament. Like what? For example, we have procurement policies. Are they friendly to the youth? Because 80% of the budget is procurement. Uh, can we compete favorably with other members like old people to get these tenders for government? Can we? These are the issues we expect them to articulate in parliament. You look at the issue of unemployment. So all these issues have been left behind and they are pushing their personal agendas on how to become ministers and sustain themselves in parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Talking about other interest groups putting the youth aside. Do you think other interest groups have performed what brought thank, them? Thank you so much, Madam. Thank you so much. Which one are you focusing on? Mine is so much about the armed forces in the parliament. The army. The, the UPDF. Uh, it has not served the interest. It has not served the interest because it tends to be on only one side, the government side. And I don't see so much its relevance in parliament now that the, the, the parliament is full of many parties. It has FDC, DP, and, and the like. So it's it's irrelevant in the parliament. Uh, it's supposed to go as soon as immediately because but it's not working. But you just listening posts in parliament. They don't contribute. But, but they always go on one... they fought for the liberation of this country, I think it would be good for them to sit in parliament right. and listen to the policies that these people are making for the people they fought for. Don't you think so? In fact, my idea would have been uh, if I told had allowed police to be in parliament because police deals with the communities on a day-to-day on on day -day basis. Police and maybe the prisons. It would be better. But the UPDF which is supposed to be manning the territory of the country, wouldn't have been in the, in the, in the parliament. Now, let me also come to women MPs. You get? <laughs> Talk about that. Yeah, women MPs. Women MPs would be relevant in the parliament, but, but, but the way they are elected, the way they are brought in the parliament is not the best way. Nor have they served the purpose for which they were created for in the constitution. Have they been uh, women MPs? Not necessarily, because if they were to be, if they would have served they would be like in the maternity wards, they would be with the women. They are not doctors. No, I mean, I get your point, yes, I get your point. I, I get your point, Madam Speaker. At least they will be with the women groups all the time. But since these MP, women MPs are elected by, by men and by all of us, they won't necessarily serve the interest of women because they're not elected by all, only the women. But if it's only the women electing them, they would be, they would be focused only on women. What haven't they done? Like, like I did say, like I did say, Women MPs will be so much relevant. I'll be finding them like in the markets. I mean, I've been around. Doing here. what? Talking to the women in the markets to know the issues. What are, what are affecting? Most women are always in the markets, yes. doing work, selling dodo, selling katunkuma, all those kind of things. So you mean well, they have to go to people? Yes, to know their issues. Start what their problem is. Yes, and then and then they bring them in parliament. Information. And then bring them in parliament. Information. Takes that microphone for information. A woman member of parliament is giving you information, <laughs> honourable <laughs> member. Yes, so Nabila, you're welcome to NTV People's Parliament. Please give the information. Thank you. I want, Madam Speaker, I want to give the Honorable Member information that m women vote men and men vote women. Yes. So is it in order? Actually, it's an order. <laughs> is it in order for the Honorable Member to continue saying that women members of Parliament should only be voted by women, but the 
constituency MP <coughs> should be voted by everybody. Yes, I, I hear you, Honorable. I think it has been a mix-up by the people. When they say women MPs, I think the population think they represent women. Yes, Honorable Member, have you served the purpose of which you were created or in the Constitution? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, again, my name is Betty Amongi, and I chair the Women's Caucus in Parliament. I want to first start by stating that the purpose why the women representatives were constitutionally provided for was to redress the imbalances in leadership. Have we moved forward to, now as we speak? Yes, because um, by women being in parliament, we have been able as women parliamentarians through our caucus to prioritize women's agenda in the budget to prioritize women's agenda in the policy and in laws. So all the laws that deals with women has all been moved under our women's caucus by the women's uh, movement supporting us and women members of parliament in the forefront. The Domestic Violence Act, trafficking in persons, female genital mutilations, all we have prioritized maternal health in the budget of parliament. Now you cannot go in Ministry of Health and you will hear anybody not talk about maternal health. You will not go in any health center and not find the, 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 the maternity words in most of those health centers because the women members of parliament sitting in parliament are capable of saying women need maternity. Women needs midwife. Women need ambulance to take them to antenatal. But honorable, a way forward from yes. 96 to date, haven't you achieved that? Uh, if I'm to, to give you the statistics, the women in parliament constitute 35%. So we have not yet arrived at the parity. What we are talking uh, about by the UN African Union is that leadership must be parity, 50-50. And actually, according to the just concluded census, we are more than the men. So we should actually be more than 50% in parliament. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Member. We are going for a short break. And when we come back, we shall be discussing whether we really still need these women MPs in Parliament. The youth, people with disabilities, the army, and the workers MPs. Welcome back. You are still watching NTV People's Parliament. I'm still Agnes Nandutu, the Speaker of People's Parliament. And we are discussing, do we still need interest groups in parliament? Remember, honorable members, they are not only youth and women MPs, there is also UPDF, people with disabilities, and the workers. Have they performed? Where have they gone wrong? Yes, honorable member. Your take. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, honorable members of parliament, I'm Chigo Hakim. Uh, let me begin with the American representatives in Parliament. <coughs> These interest groups have a role to play. They have a role to make better policies. But the, the Army MPs have been there, but what policies are very, really formulated for the Army? By the time, by the time that they began to date, I'm seeing there are only another, there are, there are another group that's busy consuming the taxpayers' money without a purpose in Parliament. What about the workers? Uh, the workers MP, Madam Speaker, uh, the labor laws, I'm an HR student, I was an HR student, and I have a bachelor's degree in management management. But when you look at the labor laws, which were formulated by this Parliament, that is 2006, I really wonder what the, the other parliaments from then have done. The, the laws we are using, the labor laws, were for 2006. So what you mean is that we, we, we need these interest groups in parliament, so? But the only problem is, not, is they haven't done what they were created for in the constitution. Is that so, Honorable Member? I don't think that we need these interest groups in parliament. I just think that the parliament needs to only formulate select committees 
on labor issues. These interest, these interest groups are, are basically wasting the taxpayers' money. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Member. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm representing my people from, from Lubaga. I would like not to take back these people in Parliament. You don't want them to go back at yes, all. All the five especially the worker, groups. especially the workers, especially the workers. What have because what have they done? I would I would I would see them yearning to see that the the, the wage bill is tabled. People are there out crying. They are mispaid. My my colleague talked about uh, the number of the women. We are not about the number. We are about we are about performance. Have you performed? If you have not performed, please sit back and think about it in the other way around. Because you're coming back, we are, we are going to judge you. People are there, we are, we are going to judge you. Have you worked or not? Don't think about the number. Think about the performance. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. You are a woman member of parliament representing Kampala District. Yes. The people have spoken. You are doing nothing for them. Well, I can say that, uh, Honorable Speaker, that we were pledging and we were bridging a gap as members of parliament. Unless people say the gap has never been there. And if the gap has always existed, that men were 90% in parliament, and Uganda is more than 50% women, and only less than even 5%, was periodically in parliament then there was a gap that gender Hasn't gap that gap been now the gender since gap 1996 honorable speaker the gender gap will stop when people stop producing <laughs> because women women are being produced and that gap needs to continue being bridged we have a responsibility as citizens of this country despite our gender to be representatives of our people I can only say that, unfortunately, society wants to put a bar on women that they are not putting on men. The, the yardstick and the qualitative performance of women is more in discussion. And the qualitative discussion on the men's performance who've been in charge of this country since we got independence has never been put to test. But Honorable, why don't you compete with other men in the constituency? First of all, I was... For instance, mm -hmm. I'm sure haven't, from 96, haven't you been empowered enough to compete with the women? Since two... Honorable member, you are representing a constituency. How did you make it? And what advice do you give to your fellow women who are still moving around in districts? They can't compete with men. We are having women the executive directors of companies. Yeah, you see, I am a woman and I'm a, a speaker of people's parliament. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, one, I want to state that the affirmative action was a platform and remains a platform to give women opportunity to get empowered economically, to uh, get empowered and build their capacity, and yes, if you build your capacity and you feel that you can move and contest with men like I did, that is the advice I'm always giving many women. That first of all, the constituency is smaller, most of the districts are bigger. For example, Honorable Nabila represents, I think, five divisions. Eight, eight constituencies. Uh, eight constituency. And, and if you are to get a, a central region, you would, uh, you would actually be more effective as a member of parliament. But also there are factors that makes most of these women not to move from affirmative action. Can I have to some the... councillors? Don't we have women councillors here from the grassroots? Do, we still, do you still need your members of parliament, in para, women members of parliament? Please speak out or you keep quiet forever. Yes, uh, Honorable Speaker, Honorable, Honorable Speaker, I have some information. Yes, Honorable. I think we need to look at the legislations and how they are meant to progress over time. <laughs> with, the, with the local council, I was a councillor, LC5. But with local council, it is a third of council that is women. Not council plus women. In parliament, we need to progress 
from saying there will be constituencies and district representatives to make that maybe a third of the of parliament ought to be women. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Um, yes, yes Honorable. To, to, to conclude, why haven't you reviewed the constitution? Because it was supposed to be reviewed by the way provided in the constitution. You're supposed to review this in 2006. But up to now, you're keeping quiet. You are comfortable in your seats. You still enjoy many, many partners a seat. We are, we are actually going to review before the, the, this, this uh, parliament ends. And the review constitutionally is either to retain or to abolish or to increase. Do you think you should and be retained there? I, I do think we should be retained. The retention can come in form of what type of political system do we retain? Are we going proportional representation like in Rwanda? I would actually prefer that because with proportional representation, which is political parties giving a certain number of percentage, it has made women in Rwanda to be 64% in parliament as we speak now so we are also discussing under what form should we retain thank the you. affirmative thank action thank you honorable member let the people speak uh, i'm called brenda kogonza i'm the honorable member of parliament representing kamwasia i want to let the honorable members of this house understand this aspect the politics of uganda has been characterized by the systematic dominance of men of women by men now, that is the reason why, when you look at the 1995 constitution, was amended to address the inequalities that exist even within the political system. Honorable Speaker of Parliament, we very much know that subordination has been embedded in all <laughs> structures. It has been embedded in the social, cultural norms, institutional law, and also the political arena. It is this subordination in the political arena that has restricted the honorable members of parliament, for example, not to do what we think they should do. However, that doesn't render them powerless. Mm -hmm. Honorable members of parliament here have done a lot. It is the honorable members of parliament that ensure that the, the, the constitution of Uganda is engendered to address aspects of women. It is the honorable members of parliament here who have made it to ensure that we have laws such as the Domestic Violence Act, the Trafficking in Persons Act, the Female Genital Mutilation, and aspects of maternal health. It is the honorable members of parliament here who indicated to the country that on a daily basis, 14 women die as a result of maternal, maternal mortality. So I want to say that the honorable members of the female honorable members of parliament are really relevant in the par in parliament. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, honorable member. Yes. <laughs> Gentlemen, <laughs> honorable. Thank you, honorable speaker. Which interest group are you talking about? All of, all of them, they are, either, they are no longer needed in parliament. <laughs> 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 Go ahead and put down your issues. Thank please. you, honorable speaker. I'm Rangi Dilisa. Oh, yeah. From Rubaga and Deba Parish. Order, order, honorable members. Honorable Speaker, my issue, my worry is about the large of a number we have in Parliament. If you continue having these, these interested Move groups, closer to the microphone, please. These interested groups, we shall conclude having thousands and thousands of MPs. Look at the, a, every every day we are creating districts. If a, a district is created, it means it it, it, it needs an M, a, a woman MP. So, in my conclusion, if these interested groups, they are to be there, to, represent, to, to be represented in the pyramid, they will be on a regional basis, because we are, we have, we are having an, a large number of MPs. What about workers? Even those workers, you can see, you see Mr. Younger Man, Honorable MOP. He can go directly and stand in, in his constituents and serve all the all our needs, all our interests. Because we are all workers. Because we are all workers, we are all human beings. He can know everything, what, what is needed by a, a person. Even if these women MPs, they can go and, and stand at direct, uh, as, as direct MPs. Because we are all equal now. So we can, we can vote them according to what they can, what they can serve. So, in my conclusion, I think that these interested groups, they are no longer needed in the MP. In, Thank in, in you, parliament. Honorable Member. He does not need the women MPs. He does, <laughs> he does not need the youth. 
the people with disabilities, I think they have not done anything for him. But let's go for a short break. And when we come back, this is a very hot issue that we still need to carry on. We shall discuss whether we should really vote them, whether we should amend the constitution, either to retain them, abolish them, or reduce the numbers. Welcome back. You are still watching NTV People's Parliament. You remember this is the platform, the only platform that can give you opportunity to air out your issues. What is disturbing you in your community, in your constituency? Is it your MP performing, your minister or your president? This is the only platform where you can come and speak to the country. Yes, let the women speak. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. The Constitution speaker. provides that there should be amendments. By 2005, there should have been an amendment to either abolish these groups, reduce them or retain them. What is your take on that? Thank you, Honorable Speaker. My name is Honorable Helen Malinga. I represent people from Chireka. Welcome. It's interesting to, to, to say that the issue of the Constitution Amendment is critical because there are so many other uh, constitutional provisions that actually require amendment. And this being one of them, it has come at the right time because we have had a lot of requests and calls for amendment. I think it's time to amend. So do However, you want it to be amended to abolish, retain, or reduce the numbers? I, I will say that I would prefer that we retain the numbers. It depends on um, what we want. I would say what is the expectation of each interest group. Uh, my take is that, take an example of people with disability. This is an interest group that actually has been marginalized for a long time. And we need to see them more. And we need to hear their issues more. And we need to see policies become more responsive to their issues. Mm -hmm. on, on, on the other hand, the issues of women representation vis-a-vis -vis men in parliament, it's a structural issue. It's a systemic thing. And, and until we come to a point where we are saying we have gender equality, not equity, we will not get there. And therefore, I call for a situation where if we are saying that we need equal men and women in parliament, we have to make a deliberate decision informed by the fact that capacity versus expectation. But now expectation. we are competing with this male. Your yes. Honorable Amongini competed with men and she won them. Yes, after her capacity. We have a finance minister who is a female. Honorable Speaker, after her capacity was built to that level, a number of women who actually would like to represent their constituencies or their districts do not have that capacity. <laughs> Thank and you. Thank you, Honorable Member. And therefore, capacity yes. building. If we are to amend the constitution, which groups do you think we should retain? Which groups do you think we should get rid of? Or we should abolish all of them? What is your take on that? Uh, thank you so much. Let me start by saying that, yes, we need these uh, different interest groups because uh, we need um, the views of these mag marginalized groups to be heard and also being addressed. Uh, the issue of amending the constitution comes in handy if there are challenges already identified. If these marginalized groups or if these uh, interest groups in the parliament come out to share the challenges they are experiencing as members of parliament. Three, if they are understanding their mandate. Because I've seen several... Do they understand their mandate according to you? According to me, some do understand their mandate. For it, uh, like uh, the women in um, WOPA, women members of parliament. But when you look at the youth, I'm sorry to say that. <coughs> I know my colleagues are here. So the youth should be abolished? Not abolished, but yes, we need but to, uh, uh, to support them, understand their mandate, avoid the politicking, and address the issues that are concerning the people. <laughs> you have heard them. Youth MPs, please style up. Yes, what do you have to say, Honorable Member? Mm, thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> please take the microphone to give us information. Uh, Honorable Men, the, youth, the, the member representing the youth wants to give us some information. I okay. think you have to take a leave somewhere. Okay. Yes, Honorable mm. uh, Gerard, what is the information you are giving this parliament? <coughs> Whatever the challenges there may be, the youth MPs are also trying. The youth MPs, at least in the ninth parliament, we've seen them push, and we have some few programs. That is the youth livelihood program. You may have your ideas or issues with it. There is the capital venture program. We are also working on a very important law. 
a law that will ensure that, for instance, foreign companies employ Ugandans. But when you bring here a company, you don't bring here all the people from that given country. Then and you that, better educate your members so who are going to contest the 2016 to, to, to do their own. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Department. Yes. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm Honorable Nalima Sara from Wabigalo Parish, Kelezia Zone. Uh, according to me, this issue of saying that the Constitution should be mandated, whether these people should be amended, amended whether these people should be removed from the Parliament. Uh, these are the very people who have been in the Parliament. So if you decide to say that these people should be removed from the Parliament, definitely they are the ones to make the Constitution, to amend the Constitution. So they, they cannot change that. They you cannot think? change their... <laughs> I'm sorry to say so, Madam Nabira Nagai. I don't think... You've worked according to what I'm seeing and according to what I hear from people. You've worked and I appreciate your way, the, the way you've done your work. But so you cannot amend the constitution that will put uh, her out of parliament. That's good. <laughs> 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 so that means we put the amendments of the laws in the wrong hands. Yes, uh, Madam Right Honorable Speaker. I think my pro proposal in terms of uh, ensuring that the role of women, youth, all the interest groups, I would like to speak cross-cutting. One, I start with, uh, with the issue of women. I think all these groups need what we call uh, a special audit or performance since the constitution was put in place. Now, a special audit would give they us... They are supposed a to be audited by amending the constitution, but up to now, these honorable members are keeping quiet because they are comfortable in there. It should be on the basis of an audit that now the amendment can come. Without any audit of understanding... Do you think this is the output, right time to bring the amendment? This is the opportunity for the audit to begin, not the amendment to start. So that we can have, to what extent have the youth of Uganda been represented fairly in the parliament of Uganda? To what extent have the women been very progressive in terms of the affirmative action seats? So that when you are recommending, for example, you said, okay, for the future, let affirmative action seats be 10 years for the women so that we have space for grooming all other leaders to come in. Yes. But not yes, to sit you can forever. hold on from there. There, there, there. there was some thought that the women MPs should have only two terms in parliament. Only two terms. Like they use it, so it's automatically it's one term. What do you say about that as you hold on? As, on as we go on, I think there is no one who would not want to progress from a large constituency to a small constituency. However, we need to look at the vehicles that women use to go to parliament and to go to these councils. The vehicles called political parties. How are they? How are they promoting women? To have these positions. How many parties in Uganda say that out of the 300 constituents or plus, we fronted 150 women and no men? We should start from the institutions that drive politics. And if we don't address the institutions in which women are players. People have been writing and people have been talking that as you struggle to increase the numbers of women in decision making positions, Actually, you women fight against each other. I don't think, well, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I think that's a stereotype yes. that is being perpetuated to say women fight against each other. We have enjoyed cooperation amongst each other. Yes. We have the most vibrant caucus in Parliament, women caucus. Actually, there is no other caucus that is as strong as the women's caucus in Parliament. Yes. So that caucus is not fighting. That caucus is working together for the good, not only of the women, but also for the general good of the children. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Yes, Honorable Member, you can... Yeah, so I just conclude. I want to, conclude. to say, basically, the baseline is that we need men and women in Parliament. But then, how should the categories be constituted is my issue. And I think I propose and I concur and support the proposal by Honorable Member of Parliament from Uyam that proportional representation is one of the best mechanisms that we can use in Uganda today to ensure that all voices that are important in society are listened to. That means that all this will take us to the roles of political parties in how they reconstruct structures that allow women representation in those political parties so that they can now sit in delegates conferences and give us 
names that can be taken to parliament, but through endorsements of delegate conferences. That would solve all these issues of making the women struggle in these spaces, the men struggle and spend money. The issue of money would actually die there because political parties will be directly responsible. Let's, can I have the women speak, please? You still need these women representatives in parliament, honorable member. The numbers should be reduced. So we should amend the constitution to reduce the numbers. That is my issue. Well, to how many? Because the, as the districts are growing up every day and every day, the numbers are increasing. And you see the numbers of members of parliament becoming big. And the women can also stand for constituency, as you've been saying it, as we have Madame Oman, Madame Nabila, you can go where you, you are staying in that constituency. The division of Kampala. And you, you stand there with men, you contest with them. That is how we shall know that we yeah, have that's, the, that's how we can realize the empowerment of women. Another group switch here, where we like uh, that of the UPDF, it is only that I would like to have a clarification. Are they not workers? I, that is my question. Because you have workers representation and a army representation. So, That's what I want. So I want to have the clarification. This yes, I, I think according to... According. <laughs> that, that, that is my question. So, yes, I went forward, Honorable. I went forward. We still need the women in there. The thing is, we need to get them more accountable. Some of them have really worked hard. Others think they went there to do something else. <laughs> so the level of accountability to ask the public for all these interest groups. Take, for instance, the workers, uh, the group for workers, MPs. Which workers are they representing? How often do they engage with the workers out there to represent their views? How often do they even speak up? Like, for example, I'm a contributor to NSSF, and this proposal of taxing our our contribution once again, I would call it triple taxing. Where are the workers' MPs? Why don't they redirect government to tax the pension scheme of the public servants? Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Honorable. To me, we should tell these interesting groups that they are also people. That is, we are just being segregative. If we, we start saying these people are representing ladies, they are representing army men, because at the end of the day, we are going to have very many groups who are going to come up and including the children and the, children, and the mad aged madmen mad <laughs> people from where i come and that kind of thing <laughs> now we all have the same problems if you are not a man if you are you are a woman representative i still believe you still face the very same problems mm -hmm. as another representative or another person faces so the way forward is we should tell these interest groups that there are also people who face the same problems as us, and so they should come back and be us still. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Yes, I walk forward. Yes, yes. Honorable. Madam Speaker, I want to give In a, terms of amending the Constitution. Yes, the women must get term limits because you cannot be empowered for 30 years. When, when shall we? No, I'm, I'm being sincere because the, the, the youth have one term. When will, they, when will they create space for other women? So we need to have term limits for women if that was the purpose to empower women so that we get more women on board. Then on the issue of workers, they should stop being partisan. The workers, MPs, they should be able to, to, to negotiate for workers. Actually, all workers, MPs in parliament belong to one party. Yes, they are partisan. I've been tasking the, my colleagues in parliament because in Kampala I represent most workers. And they come to me and say, Honorable Nabila, we have this thing. I say, but they are workers, MPs, work-related issues. But the people, the workers in Kampala, look at me as their MP. They don't look at the workers, MPs, as their MPs. So what do you so, say? Uh, the suggestion need... is the workers, MPs, I only represent unionized workers of Uganda. Yes. If you don't belong to any union, they don't represent you. Actually, I've been touched by Honorable Nabila saying that these workers MP do work with the unions. How many unions do we have? Those ones should be abolished from now onwards. <laughs> and, and again, all MPs, women and men, how many times have you talked about VHTs 
in your meetings and what is the way forward for us. Remember, we are the grassroots people down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Please wind up in one minute. Since you are a member of parliament, what do you think should be done at this particular time? Yeah, first of all, when you talk about UPDF, I even raised the matter that if we have UPDF in the, in the parliament, let us share them. Five seats on the opposition and five seats on the ruling side because they are non-partisan, but did not work out. Secondly, in Uganda's parliament, already we have people who are disabled and then in parliament. Matia Kasamba has one arm, he went through his constituency. Secondly, in the previous elections, we got a young lady of 18 years contesting the constituency, and she won. That gives you an answer why we can go for general elections and people can participate. The intention of bringing workers, MPs, ladies was not bad, but have they served up their usefulness? Secondly, I've always requested have the government. Have they served according have they to you? Served? That's the question and is a question to answer for everybody. Secondly, I have always stated in Kalungu, one time was a part of Masaka where I come from, just a sub county. And that sub county has three members of parliament. At one time, it had one member of parliament. And we are saying, we are spending a lot of money on administration. What if we contest the three of us, the woman MP? Same PGA from uh, uh, independent and the same with DP. We win, one person goes through, and the rest of that money that would have served the other two MPs. So, comes what, what is the way forward, Honorable? So the way forward to the we must, sit, we must sit as members of parliament, analyze the performance of these special groups. Let me give an example. Members of parliament are here. How many times have we raised matters of workers, matters of women, and still, because majority of these people belong to NRM. They even run out of the matters that concern them because the past might be have told them to vote against that. So our major interest now is to see how do we reduce and of course how would we work out a system that will include the women and those people in the parliament without specializing them because the purpose is not coming out. Thank you. Moment. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. There is a proposal that women should be represented regionally what is your take on that because you are the constitutional makers i oppose that from the beginning to the end <laughs> what i would support would be proportional representation because as women we are talking about parity representation in equal numbers what about serving one term serving two terms which has been proposed is a matter which we are already discussing as members of parliament but also let me state that the same way you are talking about uh, do women members of parliament go back or not what do they do is the same with men because in parliament if you see members so they are trying to marginalize women they are trying people. To, to, to only prejudice women's <laughs> participation and yet even in parliament there are very many men whom you have never heard their voice there are very many men who don't even enter that house and if you see most of the people the only two people who have been removed out of the house because of not attending all of them are men not women thank you thank you honorable member yes honorable Gerard, you present the youth <laughs> order, order, Honorable Member. Yes, I, Madam Speaker, I agree. In one and, minute. Yes. We need two members of parliament per district, a male and female. That's it. <laughs> we, don't need, we don't need UPDF in parliament and parliamentarians. Let's walk this talk. Many may think we are voting ourselves out of our jobs. Yes, if it is going to benefit our country, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. Because of time constraints, we cannot go further than this. This is a very interesting discussion, is, and we leave the ball in the hands of policymakers, members of parliament, government. When are you bringing the bill to parliament to reduce or to, to, to you say to reduce the numbers of women MPs, the UPDF? Should we retain them? Should we abolish them? Or should we reduce the numbers? We are waiting upon you, government, to bring this bill to parliament. I am still Agnes Nandutu, the Speaker of People's Parliament, and I adjourn this house until next time.